is not bad. Okay. In the baritrectin spray? Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's a hot sauce. <clears throat> okay, so it, it seems to be that the general consensus that for like a, a viable backcountry defense option has to be a, a large frame or revolver of some substantial stopping power. Um, but the truth of the matter is it seems like a lot of people, if they carry this big bore revolver, if there's a shootability versus group stopping power um, kind of a chasm there. Uh, if it's a big, heavy, big bore revolver, it seems like you know, you're, you're likely to get maybe one shot off, maybe two shots off. Are they going to be fast and accurate? That's up to you and how much time you put into to training. The commonly accepted minimums are like a 357 Magnum and a 44 Magnum. Um, sorry, my thoughts are kind of all over the place right now. Um, so basically, yeah, so the comfort of it. So like the average, like a Smith and Wesson 686, that weighs 2.6 pounds, that's unloaded. Um, a 629 44 Magnum weighs 2.277 pounds, so that's about three pounds unloaded. Uh, for guys that, that carry a 454 his soul unloaded that's 3.31 pounds um, and then if you're into like the real big stuff you can do like the 460 smith and wesson weight magnum that's about four four point four and a half pounds unloaded so that's a big piece of steel that you're that you're packing on your hip um, and I've heard, I've heard this time and time again that when it comes to like the backcountry defense you know the, the best pistol is, is not nearly as good as like the worst rifle so to speak so regardless of this monster cartridge that you're that you're carrying in your big bore rifle are you going to be able to do what you need to do uh, you know with one shot it seems like the majority of, of bear encounters they happen really fast with little to no uh, warning ahead of time and from personal experience and from research that I've done it seems like bears they they're all like people they're all individualistic so some of them might give you plenty of warning and you might have a chance to pull your bear spray or to yell at them or you know, warn them off. And others might just attack you without any warning at all. Um, if, have you guys heard of, of Todd Orr and like the encounter that he had in Montana last year? Uh, he's from Bozeman and basically he had seen this bear like 100 yards away. So he had plenty of time, it was pretty open. And so he hollered at, hey bear, you know, give it a chance to know, hey, I'm here. What did the bear do? It turned and just made a beeline for him. But he didn't know that there was cubs around the corner. So he, he had a 57 Magnum strapped to his backpack in not a very accessible place. You know, it was there as an afterthought. And then he has this can of bear spray. So he pulls the can of bear spray and he's waiting. And then he waits till she's within an acceptable distance and he deploys the bear spray. The bear just ran right through that bog and just mauled him. I mean, he was down. And so. Luckily, after she got tired of mauling him and he you know, tried to play dead, she got bored with it. But he was pretty messed up, and then finally when he recovered, he thought, oh, I have that pistol, because he could hear her in the area. And he said, okay, I got this pistol. Where is it? And he's feeling his backpack was still on, but she had mauled him so bad and torn pieces of his backpack off. His pistol was laying somewhere quite away from him. So now he's laying there helpless, and he thinks, okay, this bear's going to come back and do something again. I've got to get out of here. So he stands up. The bear comes back and falls him again. And miraculously, you know, he walked away fairly unscathed. I mean, he was messed up pretty good. But, and then, he, of course, being him, as he's walking back to the truck, he's taking cell phone video of himself about how he just got mauled and talked about the encounter. But that was what he said, you know, as like an afterthought. He, he was thinking, maybe I should have went for my pistol instead. And then it was, you know, a place that was inaccessible. But that goes back to the shootability and the ease of carry. Why did he have it strapped to the side of his backpack? Probably because it was something he wasn't that familiar with. It was kind of cumbersome. You know, um, big magnum, magnum calibers, like I mentioned before, um, there's guys that obviously that shoot, 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 shoot. But even those guys, you're not going to be rapidly just pulling, you know, these, these big, huge chunks of lead at the bear. And then, I mean, there is, unless you can hit them in the brainstem or you know, the spine and break them down, they could be dead on their feet and they're not going to realize that they're actually dead and do what they need to do. So um, I don't want to get too much into bear spray, or I'm not going to get into bear spray versus, <laughs> versus pistols because that's a whole other deal. Basically the whole point of this presentation is just to give you guys some options. Um, I 
about some alternatives like what you might carry that something's a little bit easier. Um, so back in, I believe it was the 60s, it was, uh, where did I, I just lost it. My brain is completely shot. I need more coffee this morning. Um, Elmer, it was Elmer Keith and I want to say Bill Jordan mm -hmm. that they they wanted to breach the gap between 357 Magnum and 44 Magnum. You know, something that was a little bit more shootable that you could have some extra round capacity maybe um, that, that bridged the gap, that, that was good stopping power. Well, 41 Magnum. So there happens to be an automatic cartridge that's pretty darn close. And when it first was introduced, the 10 millimeter auto was pretty much spot on. I mean, you can't duplicate every blur, obviously, with an automatic cartridge, which is something with the revolver because there's more versatility that you have there, you know, loading for a cylinder. But a 10 mm auto is nothing to sneeze at. Um, just some comparisons here. 175 grain, let's see here, it's a Winchester HTS HP. It's traveling at 1290 uh, with 649 foot pounds. So something close to it in a 41 Magnum. It's 170 grain jacked into hollow point from Corbon, and that's traveling 1275 with 614 foot pounds. Um, so obviously that's really similar. And then you think about it, like a, a Glock 20, for instance, that's, that's uh, let's see the weight of it here. I have that down here. A Glock 20, so unloaded, it's 1.725 pounds. And then loaded with 15 rounds of basically 44 Megan power loads are 2.48 pounds. So going back to you know the weight of, of these big revolvers that, that most people are going to carry, even the smaller ones, you know, unloaded, they weigh close to three pounds. So that right there, you know, that shows you that you're probably more apt to carry it. You're going to like to shoot it more. Um, I remember just from growing up here, everybody had a 44 Megan. That was just what everybody had. They had a 357 Megan. Um, <clears throat> and it, I had a really nice Taurus 44 Magnum was ported. I actually liked to shoot it, but it was big and it was heavy. And so I ended up buying like a Springfield XD40 Smith and Wesson. And then I realized that every time that I would leave the truck, I left the 44 Magnum behind and I carried that Springfield XD40 because it, you know, was nice and, and comfortable and I could shoot it well, carried 15 rounds. You know, I could, at 50 yards, I could, you know, rapid fire get about a, a pie size uh, plate in so I knew that I could lay down the firepower um, and that just kind of struck me as I was stupid you know why why would I do this and then before I started working for Lone Wolf um, I was hanging out with our head armorer and we were just shooting a bunch of guns and so he brings out this Glock 20 with a longer aftermarket slide with a six inch barrel with a five round magazine extension so he's got 20 rounds of basically what's 41 Magnum and I shot that thing and I couldn't believe you know, how comparatively you know, less the muzzle rise was, the full recoil, and I could just really drill them out there. So that, there was that big light bulb moment for me. And uh, of course, I, like, I shouldn't have sold my 44 Magnum, but like I did, like a dummy, I did. Um, and I actually sold my, my Springfield too. And so 10 millimeter is kind of like my, my favorite round. I've been carrying that in the woods for at least nine or 10 years, I love it. Um, so let's go back to, Oh, okay, and then so going back to the shootability, um, something that I talk to people a lot about is shoot and scoot. So if you're getting charged by a bear, um, knowing that you're not gonna be able to probably drop him on the first round and that's just gonna be done and you're gonna wipe your brown and walk away, you have to lay down suppressive firepower and hopefully you'll change their mind. They'll be dead, obviously, but hopefully that you can change their mind that they don't want any piece of that, just you're laying hate down, that, all that steady stream of lead. Um, so suppressive firepower is going to be a lot easier with with uh, an automatic, you know, like a, a Glock 20 or some of the other uh, smaller um, calibers. One other caliber I wanted to talk about also was 357 um, SIG. So SIG Sauer, they developed the 357 SIG cartridge to be something that was similar to 125 grain 357 Magnum um, round. So if you go over the ballistics of that, um, let me see here. So. I believe this was from the Double Taps website, which <coughs> Double Tap, that's, that's what I use, I love it. Uh, they're a great company. Um, so a 357 Magnum out of a four inch barrel. So this is, uh, let's see. So 140 grain, jack the hollow point. This is actually Cordobon, I guess. That's going 12, 1284. 
So 147 grains, so actually a little bit heavier, 357 SIG round, a full metal uh, jacket flat point out of a four and a half inch barrel. That's going 1296, so it's actually faster with 550 foot pounds, and the foot pounds wasn't available uh, for that load. So you can see, like, that's nothing to sneeze at. That's right in there with the 357 SIG or a 327 Magnum um, ballistic, but now you're talking about the carability, uh, packability, and shootability. An unloaded Glock 31, which is like the standard full size 357 SIG model. Um, it has a 4.49 inch barrel. Unloaded, it weighs 1.6 pounds. So loaded with 15 rounds of basically with 357 Magnum, that's 2.07 pounds. So, uh, you know, you can see that obviously that's that's something that somebody's more likely to be to, to carry, and they're gonna they're gonna shoot. It's they're fun to shoot. They're not like a big a big Magnum, but um, that was pretty much the long and the short of it. I mean, I I just wanted to present that to you at, in case you already did. You weren't familiar with those cartridges as like a viable choice or like an alternative to carrying, uh, you know, a large board, big frame revolver. Um, did you, you guys have any questions or anything? Yes, sir. How does the uh, 45, uh, 1911, uh, 45 automatic stack up against your twin? Well, and that's the 45 ACP. I mean, it's going relatively slow. Inherently, it's subsonic, so basically it's, it's below, you know, that 1,200 feet per second mark. So like the average, the average round is going about 890. Um, so I'd say 230 grain, you know. Like a, you hit somebody in the hand, you're gonna knock them down. Yeah, but now so you're talking about a bear. Exactly, so a bear, yeah, they're gonna feel it, but is it gonna do enough damage and get enough penetration to, to cause them to go, I don't like this, or is it just gonna piss them off, basically? So a 10 millimeter, like a 230 grain, um, like a hard cast load, that will zip right through them like a hot enough knife and butter. In fact, I had the, the ballistics of the 230 grain written down here somewhere. What about the 1911? Well, the 1911, yeah, that's a viable platform. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, if you feel comfortable, and that's the most important thing, not just these two models, it's pick a caliber that you feel comfortable with and that you know that you can shoot well and that you're going to actually practice with. A lot of guys, I'm, I'm active in the hunting industry and I'm, an, I'm a just avid bow hunter. I talk to a lot of guys that they carry whatever it is they carry and they're like, I don't really feel that comfortable with a pistol, you know, but I just carry it just, just to make sure I have it. But that's counterproductive as well. You might as well just save the weight and go out there with your bear spray and you know, win your bear. But 1911, you can get a lot of calibers. Uh, 460 rolling is something that's really popular. That's I word in the in the uh, 44 Magnum ballistics, but it is a very high pressure round, and there's some fine tuning and tweaking. But uh, 45 ACP is better than nothing for sure. But I'd probably rather almost have a nine millimeter just because of the the ballistic. If you can shoot it, if you can shoot it. But like a nine millimeter, that'll kill a bear. You know, it's the, the ballistic coefficient, the, the shape of the bullet, the size of the bullet. Plus you got 15 rounds. Plus you got you know, 15 plus rounds. So that's this thing that a 1911 has what, six or seven, a 45 ACP, something that you're basically like, you're throwing a softball at something. But you just need one to show. Yeah. That's right. So I mean, you probably could kill a bear with it if you happen to hit it right, but I wouldn't want to bet on that. Um, I actually had, had the opportunity to shoot black bear with my 10 millimeter. It wasn't planned. It was actually during bear season. I had been busy. You know, a buddy said, hey, check out, come this afternoon and check out an area with me. So I thought, oh, I'll, I'll just go light and easy. I'll take, leave my boat home. I had a light backpack, something like that. You know, I carry my 10 millimeter in a chest rig. Um, happened to be, we had this encounter in this, it was a thick brush and about 20 yards away this black, big black bear popped out in this opening, so I mean, I took advantage of it. It was chasing the saddles, what it was doing, it was doing the rut. So, so that was his, his downfall right there, because he happened, it was just perfect, you know, from here to the, the wall. He gave it a smile on his face. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, if you're gonna go out, that's the way to go. But, the, and then you talk about the shootability, I managed to get five rounds off. When the dust cleared, and I, my buddy was with me, you know, we turned and looked at each other like, did that just happen? And I'm like, how many times did I shoot? He's like, I have no idea. I dropped the magazine and I had, I had shot five times. The first three I hit, two were vital. One of them was when he turned and he faced me and we made eye contact. So I think I got excited and I kind of pulled off and shot him, you know, front and center to the rear hindquarter. And then the, the second vital one was when he turned around away and I nailed him again in the boat room. And the other two, pivoting around a tree, getting some parting shots, you know, through the brush. So, Obviously, those weren't hearing, but the point was, 
fast and accurately five rounds of something that definitely had adequate softening power. So can you do that with a, a big frame revolver? I suppose if you practice enough and you want to pack it and you feel confident, you know, then go for it. But anyone else have any questions? Sorry, I can ramble. Go ahead. I've been trying to get Lone Wolf to come speak to our group for 17 years, and I'm so happy that you guys did it this time. <laughs> awesome. And uh, if, for people who don't know, Lone Wolf has been a long time supporting member of NOAA, and they've sponsored a lot of the EIC contests over the years, and I want to say thank you for coming and, and speaking to us. We appreciate that. <laughs> And that's, yeah, that was like what I meant to wrap up with. Um, what's your name, by the way? Greg. I'm You're Greg. Yes. Nice to meet you, Greg. <laughs> so Greg and I will be putting on a shoot. And um, I actually brought two of our signature suits. Because his, he came up with the theme of the shoot was defense in the home and defense in the field. So I brought some really cool, some of our signature series 9 millimeter pistols. And then I also brought some of my personal weapons. Um, I have 57, 70, 10 millimeter. So if, I encourage all you guys to come out and you get a chance, if you haven't shot them before, you can. Yes, sir? Yeah, I have a question. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I seem to recall that the 10 millimeter was developed essentially for the FBI. It's going to be the hot, hot new thing. And they tried it for a while and then they rejected it. They didn't like it. Well, you know what? <laughs> that's, that's exactly what happened. It's pretty much, it was kind of like that. Um, if I remember correctly, there was a shootout involved, and I think there was a male and female agent, yeah. and both of them had issues. But see, they were back, it was on a Smith & Wesson steel platform, mm -hmm. and there was just a lot of bugs I think that needed to be worked out. It's actually, from my experience, shooting a bunch of different types of, of weapons, the clock platform with the palm of the frame, the way that it flexes, and the way that the intricacies of how it works, it handles that, that uh, pressure from the 10 millimeter round very well. Um, but that was the whole thing was, yeah, that some guy was carrying a 9mm with, 50, I think he had 17, probably a Glock 17, 17 rounds, and was just sipping ding, 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 while they were bang, bang, bang. And I, I don't know if it came down to training, which I would assume that it did, because... Part of that, part of it was, I'm familiar with that. Unfortunately, it turns out, I don't want to sound sexist, <laughs> but the female agent sex is in the and that, then, and that could have been it, you know, and then there's, since that, and then it kind of, the Ten Amendment kind of, like, wayward there for a while. So now, like, the run-of-the-mill stuff you get off the shelf is pretty dumbed down, so you have to go to companies like Double Tap or Underwood or Buffalo Board to get something that's close to the real. It morphed into what we call the 40 caliber now. Yeah, well, that's how the 40 Smith & Wesson yeah. that came about, was because the FBI said, we want this 40 caliber round and plenty of knockdown power, but... We want something that's less muzzle rise or equal, so if you compare 40 Smith and Wesson side by side with the 10 millimeter, it's just basically 10 and then short. I'm not a big fan of the 40 Smith and Wesson, I think the 10 and then is you know, perfect, but that's just me. But was there any other questions? Just say. Um, so I do a lot of backcountry hunting as well, sometimes in grizzly country, so you're proposing a 10 and then uh, would be a good option. Do you have any of those with you today? That's what I was saying. Yeah, if you are you going to come to the shoot here at one? Yeah, I have, um, I have my own personal 10 mm and then I have another one with a compensator on just for the fun of it. Uh, so I brought two 10 millimeters, two 376. So yeah, you're more than welcome. Double tap ammo, they donated all the all the ammo or the majority of it. So I have I have enough. I'm going to limit you, but I have enough. <laughs> I have I have enough that we can have a lot of fun. So and I have uh, 357. So if you want to see what punishment is like versus what is a nice guy's like. <laughs> Perfect. That's, of those, I understand. <laughs> that's awesome. And then that goes back to, you know, every situation is different. Every bear is different. Can you kill, you know, a bear? Um, for instance, the owner of Lone Wolf Distributors, this was years ago, back when he was an active competitive shooter. Uh, he had a buddy that, that shot a bear, and it went into the dark timber, and he, so he called JR up, and he said, hey, can you help me find this bear? So they go after it, and since he was in full competition mode, he carried, I think he had a Glock 17 on it, or maybe it was a Glock 19 on his hip, like he didn't even think about it. So nine millimeters, got 15 rounds of it. So they're going through their track and well, all of a sudden this bear just comes charging out of the brush at him. So of course at that time, I don't know what his split time was, but he was lightning fast. You want to talk about quick, you know, quick draw. But he drew three times in the face, the bear spun three times in the shoulder. He kept spinning like his momentum period and three times in the rear and it just fell dead right there. So I mean, 
But that is somebody that shot, 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 and that was with the less around that had very just wicked penetration. Nine mm is nothing to see as far as penetration. That's what's beautiful about the 357 SIG. It's a nine mm projectile with a 40 Smith and Wesson case. And so you have all that power of the 40, but then you have that smaller that has that that smaller round that has that awesome ballistic coefficient that just flashes. And, and quantity has a quality of its own. That's true. Well, <laughs> like going back to the whole thing with the FBI and the 10 mm, the the, the agents that they were getting one, two, three, four shots off, or this guy was just ripping them to doll rags. I mean, that's there's something about shootability and just you know that that brute, you know, laying the hate. I guess you know, you're just that's impressive firepower. Is there any more questions? Yes, sir. So I understand you're with black there. So you're, you're saying all this ballistic uh, information that you're giving us when flying to the ground here, also. Well, that's just it. I mean, with a big 378. I've seen tons of footage of guys, whatever, bow hunters, they arrow a bear, for whatever reason, the bear hears them and the wind switches and it just runs right towards the threat, or maybe that's been on purpose. The guide steps up and just dumps round after round after round with this huge rifle and the bear finally veers off. I mean, obviously it protects them. So this is gonna have out of it. Well, for instance, the, the um, Alaskan Fish and Game, the, the highway patrol, the, the Fish and Game officers, they're issued Glock 20s and they carry 200, or 230, actually it's 200 grain full metal jackets that they carry. In Greenland, um, the sled dog police, that they have to deal with polar bears, and that's what they carry, or Glock 20s. That's, I mean, at least something, I'm not saying that's the be-all and end-all, but it, it boils down to, again, though, what are you comfortable with? What can you shoot fast and accurately? And that's all that really matters. These are just all different. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We'll have a, a debate. Like I said, yeah, that's a whole other, we'll, yeah, we'll yeah, need beers for that. Beer. We'll need beers and like some potato <laughs> chips or something. But, <laughs> yeah. but I live actually, I don't know if you know where Priest Lake is, but I live just right outside of Priest Lake. So we don't have thick with grizzly bears, but we have quite a few up in the, the north uh, east corner. They used to drop problem bears from Glacier. <laughs> Bless their hearts. So, and I live 42 years in Alaska with the 10-foot ground. So yeah, those are even bigger than what we have, but I mean, that's that's what I carry, and it boiled down to, back from the beginning, I carried a real nice 44 Magnum, but it was big and heavy, and I found myself not feeling like carrying it. It wasn't as fun to shoot as my auto, so. I would like you to educate me. Are you gonna to come to the shoot? I will, yes. Please do, yeah. Yes, sir. I had a grizzly come into my bear bait barrel last year, uh, year before last, uh, and, and it's an Idaho, and they tell you we don't have any grizzly bears in Idaho. <laughs> but in Unit 1, they tell you you can't bait because of the, pro the proximity of grizzly yeah. bears, so that tells you why. Because then Unit 2, oh, you might encounter grizzly bears with the bears all the way down into Montana. <laughs> but I don't want anyone else's, any else's time, anyone else's time, but is there any more questions real quick? Wrap it up. Ladies in the back, anybody? Okay, well, I appreciate you for having me. Come to your seat. Thank you, Luke.